Footprints in the Landscape A Journey Through Kilmartin Glen On this walk, you'll trace 5,000 years of footprints on the landscape of what we call Dalriada. It was once part of a kingdom ruled by Scotty, or Scots, who eventually gave their name to Scotland. But a great deal happened before and after they arrived. As you explore Kilmartin Glen, you'll discover one of Europe's richest collections of ancient monuments. They form a unique linear cemetery of stone circles, burial cairns and standing stones, and you can choose to visit some or all of them. The whole walk covers about 12 miles or 19 kilometres and will take at least six hours. You can choose a shorter section or visit individual points on the route. Before you set out, make sure you've got strong footwear and waterproof clothing because ground conditions and weather can both change with little warning. If you're leaving your car at one end of the route, check on bus times to get you back. Part of the walk is also National Cycle Route number 78, but the whole walking route is not suitable for bikes. Take OS Explorer map number 358 with you and remember to follow the Scottish Outdoor Access Code. Once the last Ice Age ended, about 12,000 years ago, Nature and people continued changing the landscape of Kilmartin Glen, and change is still happening. The settlers here left us with one of Europe's largest collections of intriguing stone monuments and personal relics. We can make only informed guesses about how they used the resources around them. The Atlantic Oakwoods, the River Ad, and the waters of the western seas. All rich with trees, animals and plants for shelter, fuel, food and medicine. Later people also left their mark, as you'll see. The route ahead of you leads you across the intriguing and very special landscape of Kilmartin Glen. It's a lengthy walk through a very long period of prehistory, but you'll take away powerful memories of a fascinating place and resolute people. The timeline will help you follow the story. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point beside the Crinan Canal. You're at Dunardry. Take a few minutes to walk along the canal before you set out on the route through Kilmartin Glen to Carnassery. You might like to visit the Cairnbarn Hotel for refreshments. It's at Loch 5, about 10 minutes walk towards Loch Gilphead from here. The canal provided a short and safe route between the Clyde and the northwest of Scotland and mirrored prehistoric people's use of water as a means of travel. When the canal opened in 1801, it attracted commercial vessels and fishing boats which helped meet the demands of the Industrial Revolution for raw materials and food on the one hand and manufactured goods and fuel on the other. Lock keepers and boat's crew often exchanged potatoes and carrots for fish and coal. The canal's route lies between the flat lands of Kilmartin Glen and the hilly oakwoods of Napdale, but created many difficulties for its builders. In the 19th century, tourist traffic increased greatly and today the canal is busy with visitors and leisure traffic. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point beside Loch Avaran. This is Loch Avaran, the Loch of the Barren. It's right at the summit of the Crinan Canal and acts as its main reservoir. Canals need constant sources of water to keep the locks in operation. There are 15 locks along the 9 mile length between Ardrishig on Loch Fyne and Crinan on the Sound of Jura. The loch may have been constructed first in medieval times 
when the McTavish clan controlled this area from their castle at the north end of the loch. They abandoned it in the 18th century and now only a few stones mark where it stood. Most of the remaining stones were used during the building of the canal and for repairs to it when the banks burst. Thomas Telford, the celebrated engineer, provided expert advice when the canal was upgraded in 1817. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point in the Atlantic Oakwoods. You're standing in one of Dauriada's ancient Atlantic Oakwoods, which began growing more than 10,000 years ago when the Ice Age ended and before the Great Moss formed. They once covered much of the landscape, but now they are rare. For that reason, they are carefully conserved, because the habitats they embrace are home to a wide range of plants and animals. Some are obvious, like the spreading oaks, the elegant birches, the tough hazels and gentle ash trees. Others you have to look for, like the fungi, ferns, mosses, liverworts and lichens which prosper only in clean air and damp conditions. Watch out for red starts in summer, woodpeckers and jays, catch a glimpse of shy deer and enjoy bluebells, anemones, and primroses in spring. People have always made use of the oak woods. They coppiced timber for fuel, cut down trees to build homes, grazed animals there and gathered fruit. In the days of furnaces all around the coast, the woods were carefully managed to provide charcoal for smelting iron. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point at Danad. You've arrived at the hill fort of Danad. Dun is a Celtic word for fort. This rocky outcrop was an island after the last ice age, until the land rose and the Great Moss or Moynavor was formed. This fort by the River Ad was probably first used defensively 2000 years ago. However, 500 years later, Gaelic speaking people, later referred to as Scotty, made Danad the capital of their kingdom, Dalriada. Climb to the top of the rock and imagine yourself master of all you survey. Danad was of great importance. It guarded against invaders and traded by sea with other parts of Scotland and with Ireland. Scotty kings imported exotic goods and sent their troops out to subdue other tribes. Excavations have revealed weapons, tools, Irish pottery, Quern stones for milling grain and jewellery, some dating from prehistoric times. Kilmartin House Museum has some of the artefacts. Others are in the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. If you climb to the top, you'll see the remains of a well. A boar carved on a stone. A hollowed out bowl an outline of a footprint and several lines of what is called Ogham script. These may be associated with coronations of the kings of Dalriada. Over the years, the Scotty continually increased their influence, particularly into eastern Scotland, and they eventually gave their name to the whole country. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point on the Moyne of Or. The Great Moss, the Moyne of Or, is a place with many secrets. 
It's one of Britain's most important raised bogs, now protected as a national nature reserve. This was once impassable wetland and the only road across it is built on birchwood and wool. The melting Ice Age glaciers raised sea levels and then the land rose, freed from the weight of ice. When the sea retreated from Kilmartin Glen about 10,000 years ago, vegetation grew here and peat formed later. Hidden in these layers are pollen samples which reveal the history of plant life over thousands of years. The moss also stores carbon dioxide, helping to combat global warming. Look out for rare hen harriers hunting. And watch dragonflies dancing above the pools in summer. You'll see lots of mosses, sedges and small shrubs including bog myrtle. The oil from its leaves is good for scaring midges. The Malcolms of Poltarach drained part of the moss 200 years ago for grazing land and some of the peat was cut for fuel. This was used at the tileworks nearby at Kolochanoch, where they made tiles and bricks for the field drains used on the moss. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point beside the River Ad. Stand by the river here and imagine small boats passing by. In ancient and not so ancient times, this was the only link with the sound of Jura and the lands beyond. Until 200 years ago, the Moynavor, the Great Moss, was impassable on foot. So people arrived by water, traded by water, and powered simple mills by water. The River Ad flows from near Furness on Loch Fyne and is joined by many burns as it flows downhill. It then meanders across the flat land to Loch Crinan, changing its route over time. You may see a salmon or trout break the surface, and some of the water birds, such as goosanders, sand martens and wildfowl that find small fish, insects and vegetation to feed on. Upriver from here at Dunamuck, groups of standing stones are stark evidence of prehistoric people and their rituals. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point near Paul Talach House. You are now on the Paul Tallach estate. From here, you can see Paul Tallach house, which is now roofless and empty. The Malcolm family built it around 1850 to reflect their fortune from overseas trading. Times change, and the clan seat is now Dunthrun Castle, one of Scotland's oldest continuously inhabited castles. The family have owned the Poltalach estate since 1560 and in the 18th and 19th centuries they were pioneers of agricultural improvement. In the early 1800s they employed James Gow, buried at Kilmartin, to drain much of the Moynevor for grazing land. They managed the woodlands for timber, reorganised farming tenancies and introduce mechanisation for more productive farming. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point near Lady Glassery Wood. When you look at the standing stones here, you see only part of the picture. Recent analysis of the land using geophysical techniques indicates that the stones were enclosed by ditches, which was common at henges like this. Was the site used as a lunar observatory so that its builders knew where they were in time? No one is sure. Some think that the arrangement of stones allowed movements of the sun and moon to be tracked and lunar eclipses predicted. The stones certainly line up with some of these events. Prehistoric people might have lived simple lives 
but their intellects were just as good as ours. You'll see that three stones are covered in cup and ring carvings, which are probably about three and a half thousand years old. They form part of the extraordinary assembly of monuments that makes Kilmartin Glen a unique archaeological landscape. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point at Temple Wood. This is Temple Wood, whose trees were planted in the 19th century. It's one of the oldest, best known and most complex prehistoric sites in Scotland and has been excavated and reconstructed since the first timber circle was built five and a half thousand years ago, earlier than most other sites in Kilmartin Glen. It was partially rebuilt in stone about 500 years later but never completed. You'll feel a real sense of mystery when you're among the stones. The southern stone circle was built at the same time and you can see it's 13 remaining stones. Two small burial cairns were built and low slabs were placed between the standing stones. A further pair of cairns were added and later covered in stone and even later covered in peat. Burials and kists or stone coffins continued until about 3,000 years ago. The spiral and ring carvings on some stones are similar to those on other west coast passage graves of 5,000 years ago. No one is sure why the circles were built in a landscape possibly cleared of trees. It could have been aligned to the midday sun at the winter solstice and used to chart the movement of the sun, moon and stars. Or it might have had another purpose. What do you think? Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point at Nether Largy South. You've arrived at Nether Largy South Cairn. It was built in the New Stone Age, the Neolithic period, around five or six thousand years ago, and it is the oldest cairn in Kilmartin Glen's linear cemetery. It's the only one here with a long chambered cairn one of a type that's quite common along the west coast of Scotland. The main burial chamber is flanked by large portal stones and reached through a forecourt. Arrowheads and pottery, including an intact pottery vessel, were found during excavations and are now in Kilmartin House Museum. The cairn was used as a mausoleum for burials over a long period of time before Bronze Age people remodelled it and created its circular form. Since then, many of the stones have been robbed for building field walls and drainage channels, a type of informal recycling. Today, local people are both proud and protective of the monuments. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point at Nether Largy North. This cairn is called Nether Largy North and is one of five ritual monuments stretching in this unique linear cemetery for a mile along Kilmartin Glen. This one is between 3,500 and 4,000 years old. It was in good condition when excavations in 1930 revealed a stone coffin or kist decorated with axe heads and cup marks, which may have been carved before the stone was used in the grave. The only things found in the kist were charcoal, ochre, and a human tooth. Ochre is a yellow earth pigment used for decorating belongings. The cairn was altered to let you see the kist inside it. It's fascinating. Under the stones of the cairn, there was also a slab incised with two ovals. It might be even older than the cairn, and you can see it in Kilmartin House Museum. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point at Glebe Cairn.
You're now at Glebe Cairn, which is about 4,000 years old, but has changed over the centuries. It stands in the Glebe Field, land once belonging to the church, and is the most northerly of the monuments in the linear cemetery that makes up the ritual landscape of Kilmartin Glen. There must have been many settlements here at the time, when people built these monuments on land cleared of oak, birch, hazel and other trees. The artefacts in Kilmartin House and other museums help us trace a little of the people's lives in those days. A 19th century church minister, an antiquarian, uncovered stone circles and kists, or stone coffins, under the cairn, as well as jewellery and other possessions. The rings of stone may have enclosed a place for celebrations. A jet necklace found here was lost in a house fire. And fine pots, which may have come from Ireland, can be seen in Kilmartin House Museum. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point at Kilmartin House Museum. You're outside Kilmartin House Museum, which is the best place to discover all about the prehistoric monuments near here, how they were constructed, what they were used for and what they might mean. You'll see some of the many artefacts that archaeologists have found, which help us to understand why Kilmartin Glen is so important. There are lots of interesting displays, a good shop, and a welcoming cafe. Kilmartin Village has been here for several hundred years. Last century, Kilmartin was well known for its shops. It boasted two emporiums, which sold almost everything and where a tailor made the uniforms for McBrain's bus drivers. The fine building, which is now the museum, was the manse for Kilmartin Church. The church dates from 1836 and inside you'll see three Christian crosses that were carved near here a thousand years ago. In the graveyard and lapidarium, which means a place for displaying stone monuments, you'll find some of the oldest and finest grave slabs in the Western Highlands. They're later than the crosses and date from the 13th to the 17th century. Take time to look at them and the intriguing images carved on them. Press pause and retrace your steps back to where you left the track and follow the way markers to the next stopping point at the quarry. You're now at Kilmartin Quarry. When the last Ice Age glacier scoured out Kilmartin Glen, it left what's called an outwash of stones, clay, sand and gravel was flat and fertile. Bronze Age people buried their dead at this place around 4,000 years ago. But in recent times it became a quarry when road builders and house builders began using its gravel and sand. Some of the gravel was used in the 1930s to surface the road to Loch Gilphead, but the loose stones created havoc for motorcyclists. During the early days of quarrying, archaeologists excavated Britain's second largest timber circle and were able to record this important site of prehistoric burials. One of the artefacts uncovered was a unique pot, probably used to hold an offering of food and drink for the dead. Press pause and follow the way markers to the next stopping point at Carnassery Castle. If you climb to the top of Carnassery Castle, you'll get unrivaled views of Kilmartin Glen and the route you're about to follow. Kilmartin means the cell or church of St Martin. You'll see why this commanding view in all directions convinced Bishop of the Isles John Carswell to start building a new castle here in 1565 when Scotland was still turbulent after the Reformation. 
It became more of a home than a fortress and ended up belonging to the Campbells of Ochenbreck. However, it was damaged in 1685 during a rebellion against James VII of Scotland and II of Great Britain and then abandoned. Historic Scotland now cares for the impressive remains. Carnassery means the cairn at the path and the yellow ragwort that grows here was once used to make healing potions. Bishop Carswell translated into Gaelic John Knox's Book of Our Common Order, used at marriages and burials by the Protestant Church of Scotland. It was the first book printed in Gaelic, the language of the Highlands and the origin of place names in these parts. This is the end of your podcast walk. If you want to discover more of Daoryada, Kilmartin House Museum will tell you all about the fascinating prehistoric landscape. You can explore the Crinan Canal, which also has a podcast guide, or visit the enchanting Napdale Forest. Go to www.daoryadaproject.org for more information.